That's right. That's right. That's right. We, we, we're, we're pulling for them. In this That's right. Okay, one more. Uh, the uh, Lily orders are on page nine. Road to Resurrection on page nine as well. Doing the work of Lent is on page ten. Um, David, did you want to say something about adventurers that is coming up? Uh, just that we got 21st. We're going over to the uh, stockyard this week, Thursday. Okay. That ought, to be, that ought to be a fun time. I, we lived in war a long time. Okay, page 12. Mark, uh, Mark McKenzie is still looking for photographers. Um, and then parenting and Enneagram is on page 12 as well. This is supposed to be an interesting way to tie in the, the study of Enneagram with um, parenting children. So I hope, I hope that's well attended. Uh, Wilshire welcomes Robert P. Jones and Greg Garrett on the 13th and 14th. Um, <coughs> I've got a belong team meeting on the 14th, but I think we're going to cancel it so we can go to this. Uh, Mark Wingfield is hosting a webinar on that Sunday afternoon, and lunch will be provided, and it'll be a, a great time to be there. You can read that on page 13. Um, David Beck, our first black and white uh, I am Wilshire photo, but that's the one you want. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, well, mine, mine is black and white. It looks, I'm already gray and white, so it's uh, at any rate, so uh, I think I'd fade out. But at uh, any rate, that good, interesting story on David back here. He's a relatively new member, went to, went to Puerto Rico, and uh, very interesting story. Um, anything else church-wide that, that we need to go over before we give this to Vanessa? If not, Vanessa, it's all yours. I'm going to pass the prayer book around, and if we go back about 1040 or whenever you finish, all right. that would be great. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So you saw Dennis' email, and uh, he was so apologetic, and I was like, it's really not a big deal. Problem. <laughs> um, because I don't think we'll get to all of it today anyway. Yeah. So, um, but Brian had a, had a question of, you know, did you know anything about Elisha before you were assigned this class? And I was like, well, 
I knew that I always got Elijah and Elisha mixed up. And I think it would have been nice if they just named him something different. <laughs> but they didn't ask me. Um, and then we were talking about the song for Elijah. Who sang it and what's it about? Do y'all remember? You mean that Elijah? Because oh, no. <laughs> okay. you know, okay. isn't it a that's country? I looked it up. Elijah? When you want to no, Elijah. Uh, I know Collage. It, 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 it's Collage. Is it Collage? Okay, yeah. there you go. And so, what's where is that from? It's a wooden Indian. Collage of the wooden Indian. The wooden Indian. Oh, yeah. thank Bob you. Bob Wills. Okay. So hey. that's what uh, I always heard Hank as Williams. Elijah. Hank Williams. Collage. Uh huh. That, that way. That's the one. <laughs> that's the one. Close. <laughs> 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 Okay, so now you've learned something in Sunday school today. <laughs> You're welcome. Learn to make Williams. Yeah, there you go. All right, so we're gonna um, we're gonna start out with the first uh, three verses, um, which is the calling uh, or the call that Elisha received. Um, so if you'll join me in First Kings, chapter 19, verse 19. And as I read this, I'm going to invite you to just listen and note what jumps out at you. Is there anything, any words that jump out, any ideas or something that you think is weird or doesn't make sense? Okay. So, he went out from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, who was plowing. There were 12 yoke of oxen ahead of him, and he was with the 12th. Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle over him. He left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, let me kiss my mom, my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. Then Elijah said to him, go back again, for what have I done to you? He returned from following him, took the yoke of the oxen and slaughtered them. Using the equipment from the oxen, he boiled their flesh and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he set out and followed Elijah and became his servant. What a strange sequence of events. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my first thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so how do you plow after you <laughs> kill your 12 oxen? Well, he doesn't need to plow anymore. Oh. Uh, right? Because he's following Elijah. But didn't Elijah send him back? Kind of. <laughs> so, when I first read this, and Sam and I were talking about this, it reminded me of the call of the first disciples, uh -huh. yes. right? Mm -hmm. They're fishing. Jesus says, come follow me. And Zebedee's sons are like, wait, we got to go get our stuff in order. we got to say goodbye. And Jesus is like, no. If you're coming, come. If you're not, not. But here, Elijah's like, sure, go ahead, go back. <coughs> there are so many pieces in this passage and then the one in 2 Kings um, that I kept finding in my brain connecting to stuff in the New Testament. Now, I'm not going to say that that's a scholar, scholarly connection. It's just, it, for me, it reminded me, oh, this is how it was for the Hebrew people when they would hear these stories around the fire pit, fire pit at night. They would hear this story, and then they would be like, oh, so Elijah's kind of like Moses, and you're going to hear a lot of that in the second passage. Oh, so Jesus is like Elisha and Elijah. So it was kind of cool to me to realize, oh, I, I finally get it now. I can tie the threads together, um, even if loosely. So I never, I never thought about this until you were talking about that. Makes you wonder about the scriptures. Say good, more. Good lawyers. Don't like eyewitnesses because they never tell the same story. There you go. <laughs> All this stuff that was heard around the campfires from different people. Maybe that's why we have so many different versions. That is absolutely thing. why we have so many versions. And if y'all haven't studied the priestly source and the Deut Deuteronomic source, I can never say that word. And um, there's one other. Q. No, Q's New Testament. Oh, yeah. But these are the three sources for Old Testament. Huh. Um, Genesis, the first 11 chapters. All oral stories. There are myths that were told around the campfire to explain why things are the way they are. Now, are they true? Probably not. Do they have truth within them? Absolutely. And that's what myths do, right? 
So you're absolutely right. We got to be a little suspicious. Um, I'm always skeptical when someone says, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. It's like, well. <laughs> so, um, so in this verse, we have a couple of things happening. So there's this guy, Elijah, very well-known prophet. He is <clears throat> followed by all the priests in the land. So when Elijah shows up to your town, the priests all come out, you know, want to sit at his feet, literally, and, and study. So um, he's out walking, and he passes this guy in a field who's plowing with his 12 um, yoke of oxen, which means there's how many oxen? Oxes? Oxen? 24. 24. 24. Right, you got two in a yoke. So it's a lot of beef, <laughs> which is a symbol for how wealthy Elisha's family was, okay? Because not a lot of people had 12 yoke of oxen, um, much less land to plow. So Elijah passes him, and he threw his mantle over him. In the NIV, New International Version, it says he threw his cloak around him. So... When you hear the word mantle, what do you think of? Okay. Kind of, yeah, yeah. And and if we pass along the mantle, what are we what are we doing? Making that person. Good. We're passing the torch, right? Same kind of thing. And that's exactly what's happening here. Okay. So Elijah throws his cloak around Elisha and keeps walking. And Elisha is running. Wait, wait. I want to follow you. Is that, I wonder if that means that he already knew who each other were, or, or did he follow him just because he had his mantle thrown over him? Fair question. Um, the way the text presents it, everybody knew who Elijah was. Because he was kind of a troublemaker prophet. You know, he was... <laughs> we'll get there. Yeah, he was, he was causing trouble for the kings. He was causing trouble, calling the Israelites back to God, back to being faithful. That's what prophets do, right? They stir the pot and they say, hey, you're not doing what God says to do. You need to get your act together, and here's what you need to do to do that. And people don't like it. So, that's what Elijah did. Um, you may remember Elijah is the one that um, really irked Queen Jezebel. Okay? And there was this competition and Elijah says okay fine you bring your priests I'll be alone I'll be the priest of God you bring your priests of Baal and both of us will build a fire I mean so uh, we'll set up a fire not light it and we'll put beef on it and we'll see who wins basically well sure enough all the priests of Baal couldn't make the fire light Elijah prays and boom fire barbecue Barbecue. Okay? So that was um, one of many moments. It was basically the high point of Elijah's ministry. Saying, hey, I'm who I say I am, and God is who I say God is, and y'all are worshiping a false idol. So you need to come follow me. And sure enough, the Israelites like, oh, we're sorry. We'll come back. Now, what, who does that sound reminiscent of? When did they do that before? Worship ball, get called into account. Yeah. Moses, right? So parallels. You've got Moses. He goes up to the mountain. Aaron's supposed to pull down the fort. He doesn't do a very good job. The people get antsy. They make the golden calf. Moses comes back down. What have y'all done? Calls him back into faith. So same thing with Elijah. But this time, he's really ticked off the queen. And the queen's threatened to kill him. So he runs away. He's in a cave, and you know the story. The storm came by, the fire, or the earthquake came, God wasn't there. The fire came, God wasn't there. The storm came, God wasn't there. But after the storm, there was silence. And in that, Elijah heard the call of God. Okay? It's, and that's the term that we know, still small voice. That's not the original text. Oh, no. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it's translated in a lot of hymns, especially. But a closer translation is um, in a sound of fine silence. Mm. 
Right? Still small voice is way more poetic. I get it. So, so that's Elijah. So to answer, that was a long answer to your question, Dom. But yeah, they knew who, who this guy was. Is that the Simon and Garfunkel translation? Right? Sound of silence? Yes. That's all I can think about. Clearly I have music going around in my head. So, so I think Elisha did know who it was that was throwing this coat around him. And I'm guessing they had a little bit of a chat, not just, hey, boom, throw my coat over you and I'm keeping on trucking. Thank you. Mm, pretty much. It's kind of like what it was. Um, so, but then it says he wanted to go back, kiss his mom and his dad, and then pledge to follow him. And Elijah responds, go back again. But what have I done to you? And that's really a weird wording in English, but basically he was saying, I'm not trying to hold you up. If you want to go back to your parents and say goodbye, go back to your parents. What have I done to you? How am I keeping you from following? How am I keeping you from going back to your parents? So Elijah basically is saying, fine, go back, do what you need to do, and then come follow me. Okay? You know what's interesting, though, because I always, this story and his action in this, bring to mind Jesus' words in the New Testament where he says anyone who puts their hand to the plow and looks back is not fit to Follow. be my disciple. Exactly. And so I find it interesting that here he's okay with that, mm -hmm. but then Jesus, Jesus I don't know, God. it's just hard to reconcile the two of those, Completely right? Completely agree. Because then agree. Jesus also talks about taking care of your family members, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. From the cross, he's like, right? hey, yeah, no, no. take care of my mom. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, it also is kind of interesting that, you know, we're always, we're always looking at the Old Testament saying, oh, that was a prophecy of what's to come in the New Testament. When a lot of what was happening in the New Testament, even Jesus' parables and stuff, I grew up thinking, oh, those are stories he made up. Mm. But they were parables and stories that people were familiar with. Sure. So is he, like you said, Diana, yeah. is he looking back, this is a story they've heard, how Elijah mm -hmm. called Elisha or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so he's making a new he's reference. Different. So everything right. is always like, oh, this, this is the new way. way. Right. Right. So yep. well, that's a great point. That's interesting, great point. interesting, last week when Timothy was here, he he said that now people, like a lot of seminaries, right, The they don't refer to it as the Old Testament. They call it the Hebrew, Bible. Hebrew, Hebrew Bible. Scripture mm -hmm. because... Because it's part because of our rich. history, right? right? And so, in that way, it also kind of makes you think about the continuity of the story, mm -hmm. I guess, versus new and old. You know? Yeah. And Dennis, thanks a lot, by the way, for putting me after Timothy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Elisha has a feast with his family, which also reminded me of the prodigal son. <clears throat> So they have a party, and then he goes to follow Elijah, and they're off. We don't hear about him again until chapter 2. So chapter 2 is this chapter, 2 Kings, sorry, thank you. 2 Kings chapter 2. Um, so in chapter 2 of 2 Kings, we've been hearing about the reign of this king and kingdom, um, I'm not going to pronounce his name right, but it's Ahaziah. And then there's this chapter about Elijah and Elisha. And then it picks up with the <clears throat> new kingdom, um, with a new king. And this prophet story is tucked in there. Why? We don't know for sure obviously, but the commentaries seem to agree that it's a way that the Jewish people marked and said, hey, yeah, we had kings, and yeah, we had kings, but Elijah and Elisha, they had power that the kings didn't have. They had p divine power, power from God, authority from God that the kings on earth did not have. Um, which I thought was interesting. Because in chapter 2 Kings chapter 2, not only do we see, is it sandwiched between these two kings, but we're seeing the trans transition from Elijah to Elisha. And that 
passing of the mantle or passing of the torch. Vanessa, is it possible the, the it seems like the kings on earth from the 1500s on thought they had divine power. Did they kind of try to usurp this or something? Or Oh, well, yeah. When you start getting into monarchies, particularly in Europe, right. they are absolutely in bed with, pardon my French, with the church. And it was all about money. It was all about power and economics. So you bet they're trying to capture this. They aren't going to be bothered by this distinction of <clears throat> divine authority versus mm. earthly authority because they're going to claim it all for themselves, mm -hmm. right? Um, it reminds me of modern day where, you know, there are many who believe that God has ordained a certain person to be president, oh. mm -hmm. right? That, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, okay. So let's jump over to chapter 2 of 2 Kings. And it's pretty long, so I don't know that I want to read have anybody read the whole thing? Um, would somebody read for us chapter 2, verse 1 through 3? We'll start with that. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. So, Elisha's on his way out. Elijah is on his way out. And Elisha is expecting, but not promised, that he's going to take take up the prophecy from there. The prophets that were in Bethel, I think of it more as like a group of religious leaders who were following Elijah. They come out to greet the two of them, and they want to make sure that Elisha knows, hey, Elijah's not going to be around. You know, today's the day. I couldn't find anything that talked about why Elisha told him to stay quiet. I guess he figured, well, Elisha, Elijah is the prophet, and so he doesn't need y'all to tell him that he's going to die today. He probably already knows that. But I couldn't find anything in the, com in the few commentaries I looked at to back that up. Um, so the next section, verses 4 through 5, same story, except they travel from Bethel to Jericho. Same thing happens. Priests come out. They say, hey, Elisha, do you know that Elijah's about to kick the bucket? And he says, yes, I know. Keep quiet. Then verses 6 through 8, same deal. Um, but now they have made it to the Jordan River. So let's pick up at... Verse 6b. So the two of them. Somebody read that through 8. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went, and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. And then Elijah took his mantle, and rolled it up, and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry land. Well, what does that sound like? That <laughs> <laughs> Holy Moses. Right? right? Holy Moses. Exactly. You know, Moses had the staff, the rod. Um, Elijah has this mantle that comes up again, a cloak. He rolls it up and he smacks the water. The water parts. Okay? Now here, there were prophet, the prophets were hanging back, but they were witness to this event so that they could testify that, hey, this happened. Elijah and Elisha crossed the Jordan. Now they're in the wilderness. The Jordan River was the boundary. Think of it as the Rio Grande. <laughs> um, except here, the Jordan on the side where all the priests and prophets were was the kingdom, 
it was organized, it was a city, it you know, had rules and regs and running water and you know, all the things. But on the other side of the Jordan, now that they've crossed the Jordan, is all wilderness. Also, similar to Moses' story. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights for 40 years, depending on which story you read. Um, and now Elijah and Elisha are in the wilderness, and when you're in the wilderness, the only thing you have to count on is God. So they crossed over, and then Elijah turns to Elisha and says, and I, I imagine this as a, almost as a parent to a child, you know, maybe an adult child, but to a child saying, what can I do for you? In other words, what can I pass on to you? What do you want from me before I die? And Elisha says, please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. And Elijah responded, you've asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. So here Elisha is saying, you know, okay, I get that you have to leave me, but if you're going to leave, give your, give your spirit to me in double portions so that I may know Yahweh as you do and double that. So it's twice the amount of inheritance that a typical Hebrew son would expect from a father. Double portion. He's not being greedy. He just recognizes that Elijah is a pretty powerful force because of the spirit that God has placed within him. And Elisha recognizes perhaps, hey, I know Elijah and I ain't him. So he's asking for a double portion. The sad thing to me is, how does Elijah respond? If you see me. Yeah, but before that he says, well, that's a hard ask. <laughs> I mean, talk about a slap in the face. It's like, <laughs> you just asked me what I wanted and I told you, and now you're saying you don't know if you can give it to me or not? It's not just to give. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. Mm. And so he says, if you see me, <laughs> take it up. The, the, the message is what I keep on my... Oh, uh -huh. Because sometimes... It's really great. Yeah. It's, really, it's, it's not always... Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's not. Okay. <laughs> this is interesting. So, Elijah said to Elisha, what can I do for you? Elisha said, your life repeated in my life. I want to be a holy man just like you. Well said. Way more sense, right? Way more. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And and the Hebrew backs that up. The Hebrew basically uses the word um uh uh, uh where did I write it down? Ruach. Anybody know where we've seen that word before? It's breath, right? In the mm -hmm. beginning God Exactly. Yeah. So ruach is the Hebrew word that basically means life force, vitality, that um, energy and authority from God. Okay. God breathed into Adam, and he came to life. So that's what he's asking. I got goosebumps just now. That's what he's asking for. He's like, hey, I recognize you got the thing. You got it, and I. I really hope that I can follow in your footsteps as faithfully as you have. So will you give me whatever it is that lets you do what you do, lets you be who you are? And it's Ruach, okay? That, that life-giving spirit. Um, let's see, cover that, cover that, cover that. Okay, so... Elijah says, it's not mine to give, basically. But for some reason, he says, I think if you see me being taken up, if you're allowed to see that, then it's going to be yours. Which, it turns out, is what happens. All right, that's when the whirlwind happens. So, um, verse 11. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. 
and Elijah ascended into a whirlwind into heaven. So I'm going to stop there before we figure out, find out if Elisha saw it or not. Because the chariot of fire and the horses of fire is an important symbol. It's not that Elijah was in the chariot of fire and taken up, which you see a lot of um, medieval artwork that shows that. It's that the two of them are walking along and all of a sudden, there's a chariot and horses of fire that divides them, separates them. And the commentaries talk about how in that moment, the earthly prophet is connected to the divine. And so Elisha is then past the mantle. He's staying here on earth and has the word, the prophecy. But Elijah is taken to heaven, is connected and united with the divine. Um, yeah, so um, it's an important distinction that these chariots of fire, that, Im that image makes, that now where they had been walking along side by side, now they've been separated and Elijah has been taken away. Okay? All right. Isn't Elijah one of the ones in the Bible that isn't there two people in him and one other person that don't die? Yes. Taken up. Enoch. 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 Yes. Enoch. Yes. And we're going to see Elijah again, right? In New Testament. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay. So now they're separated, and Elisha keeps watching, and he cries out, Father, Father. And then he cries out, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. A lot happening right there in those two little verses. Okay. So first of all, Elisha cries out, Father, Father. You know, in, in grief. You know, when you, when you lose someone, you cry out in grief. You know, Dad, don't leave me. And... By using the title father, he signifies, not that he was a biological father at all, but he was the father in ministry. He was, he was the father that Elisha followed, wanted to emulate. But then that second phrase, I was like, what? The chariots of Israel and its horsemen. Well, why is Elisha, Elisha crying that out? And it's, again, that title recognizing that the chariots of Israel is a, a symbol for the protection that Elijah gave to Israel. He was a leader, he was the master, but he was also the protector. And when the fire, the chariot of fire and the horses of fire took him, divided them, and in the midst of that, Elijah ascends, it shows that he's like no one else in Israel. No one else in the Hebrew people. He alone has been taken up to be with God. He didn't die. He's been taken up to joy in heaven. I never noticed in verse 14 before about the water parting. I mean, another Moses type analogy on that. Yeah, we're, yeah. we'll get there. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. We're almost there, Dennis. <laughs> so, so the last thing I want to mention, um, and you probably know this about the Jewish tradition, um, but he rents his clothes, and that is a sign of the Jewish tradition of grief and, and of mourning, which they do a lot better job of ritualizing than us Jesus followers do. Um, okay, so then Elisha picks up the mantle that Elijah had been carrying, same mantle that was thrown over Elisha back in the day, and he rolls it up, and he went back and stood at the bank of the Jordan. Now remember, he's on the wilderness side. The prophets are still over there on the um, kingdom side. And so what does he do? He takes the mantle and he strikes the water saying, 
where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And he, when he struck the water, when he struck the water, the water parted to one side and to the other, and Elisha walked back over. So, why? Yes, it definitely harkens back to Moses, but before that, what did the prophets associate him with? Not before Moses, but more recently. So the prophets are witnessing this, and they're like, holy cow, he just did the same thing that Elijah did, so he must have ruach. He must have the power that Elijah did. So that's the first sign that Elisha was, in fact, the one chosen to follow Elijah. Do you think the, uh, the people on the other side of the river saw the chariots? Do you think they saw That's not mentioned, that? and I don't think so, because it talks about how they were walking and talking. So they were walking probably deeper into the wilderness. We don't know for sure, but that, that was my interpretation as I read it that they were trying to, Elijah recognized, hey, we, we need to have some time, just the two of us, so I'm going to part the water so we can go over there, and I'm going to pass on my wisdom to him. Okay. Uh, I didn't know that. Now, my question is this, and you make, I couldn't come uh, with an answer. So, did he go on up and with the horses and the chariots you said he wasn't in there, but did they go with him, or were they now down with Elijah, giving um, the impression that he is now the head guy of the nation? He so, didn't say that, and you didn't mention it, so I don't know if anybody else Right, here. we don't know. Okay. It just The only time it mentions the um, chariots is that it separated the two of them. Right. And then... After the whirlwind happens, um, Elisha cries out, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And so the commentary made, said that that was a title. So there were two titles that Elisha gave to Elijah, cried out in that moment. The first was father. The second was the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And that was a metaphor um, representing, hey, yeah, there were kingdoms and there were kings with armies protecting Israel, but that's not really who protected Israel. It was actually Elijah. Yeah, there was this kind of like I didn't know if that was a, a sign to Elisha. That just like Elijah, all the all, all the castles, fire came down and zapped it. <laughs> and I'm giving you that same kind of power, so don't be bashful. Right. Right. So they did not meant that at all. Right? Yeah, it doesn't say that. the right. The way the scripture is written, it's more that that chariot of Israel and its horsemen is more related to who Elijah was. Um, the mantle is the first sign that Elisha does, in fact, was granted the ruach or the the power, the force. Um, <clears throat> so, and in one commentary, it said that Elisha had to strike the water twice. Um, but I didn't see that. It looks to me like it's only one time, so I'm not sure where the commentator, commentator was getting that. All right, so now Elisha knows that he has the power. So then he goes back, he walks back across dry land because the water's parted. And when the company of prophets who were at Jericho saw him at the distance, they declared, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. So they testify to what they've seen and acknowledge Elisha must be who he said he was. They came to meet Elisha and they bowed to the ground before him. They said to him, see now, we have 50 strong men among your servants. Please let them go and seek your master. Who are they seeking? Elijah. Yeah. They didn't believe he was taken up. They thought maybe he just got swept away in a tornado and then like Wizard of Oz got dropped down in a new place and they needed to go find his body. And Elisha's response is, 
uh, or they go on to say, maybe that the Spirit of the Lord has caught him up and thrown him down on some mountain or into some valley. And Elisha responds, nope, don't send them. Don't send those 50 people. But they urged him until he was ashamed. Um, and in the NIV, it says they persisted until he was too ashamed to refuse. So basically, they keep poking at it, saying, please, 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 let us go, let us go. It's like the kid at the checkout line in the grocery. But mommy, I want it. Please, please. <laughs> so finally, he gives in. He's like, fine, send them. Do what you need to do. So they sent the 50 men. They come back in three days, and they didn't find him. When they come back to Elisha, for he had remained in Jericho waiting for them, he said, didn't I say to you, don't go? I mean, Elisha's kind of a smart aleck. <laughs> kind of like Elijah. Yeah. Did I keep you from going back to your parents to say goodbye? No. And here Elisha's saying, I told you. And he just couldn't quite resist the I told you so. <laughs> just couldn't quite do it. So a um, couple of other interesting things since we have about five minutes. This is miraculous. I'm going to finish on time, Dennis. <laughs> That's two times in a row, y'all. I'm just saying. <laughs> so, um, Elisha translates, my God saves. Who does that sound like? Yeah, Jesus. God with us. Or, if you think about Palm Sunday next week, Hosanna, God save us. So, in naming Elisha, my God saves, it's the very embodiment of those who followed Yahweh. It's their claim of, hey, this is the God who emancipated us from Egypt, who heals, who rescues, and who transforms, transforms a people. Okay, let's see. So we talked about that. So, the next part of Elisha's story, he goes on now that he's proved to himself and, and to the prophets, yeah, Elisha has said, yes, you're the guy, go forth. Well, then it gets really interesting. So, if you flip over to the chapter 8, 1 through 15, and this, I think, is very funny. Do what? Well, we're getting there. Right here. You got it, Pat. Yeah, so this is just weird. So the first thing Elisha does is um, the people, in, the prophets in Jericho say, hey, our water's gone bad. What are we going to do? We have no water. And Elisha does this weird thing where he says, Give, bring me a bowl of salt. He tosses the salt in the water. And not only is the water good, but now they're not going to have any miscarriages. Why do we care that they not have miscarriages? Because it's trying to carry on. Exactly. The Hebrew faith is all about two things, land and perpetuating the pure race. Okay. So miscarriages are a big thing. And I think last time y'all talked with Timothy about circumcision, mm -hmm. the whole point of circumcision was the male babies were dying because they were getting infections in their penises. And so in order for the Hebrew people to do what the rabbis needed them to do, which was to cut off the foreskin, what parent is going to voluntarily say, yeah, you can cut off part of my son's anatomy. <laughs> so they said, no, 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 God said this. This is a sign of the covenant. We have to do this as God's chosen people. Why? Well, it doesn't say it in the scripture, but it was a health thing. So that the Jewish boys would live past two years old. Okay, so same thing here. No miscarriages because the water's good. Then there's this huge public massacre instigated by Elisha. So, um, so Elisha comes to this woman and says, Get up, go with your household, and settle whatever you can, for the Lord has called a famine, and it will come in the land for seven years. So the woman got up, did according to what the man of God said. Um, now the king was talking 
to the servant of the man of God, saying, Tell me all the great things that Elisha has done. And while he was telling them how Elisha had restored a dead person to life, the woman's son, who had restored to life, appealed to the king for her house and her land. My lord king, here is the woman, and here is her son, Elisha, restored. And when the king questioned the woman, she told him. <coughs> so the king appointed an official for her, saying, Restore all that was hers. So I skipped over a part, sorry. Um, so this woman came to Elisha and said, you're a man of God, my son has died, and you let him die because of the famine. And Elisha says, take him upstairs. He goes upstairs, heals the boy, carries him back down, and the woman is <coughs> affirmed, you are a man of God. You are actually who you say you are. Okay. Does that sound like any story we've heard? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, not just Jesus and Lazarus, but the little girl, right? He takes her upstairs. She's just sleeping. She comes down, and, and they they celebrate. Um, Pat, where did I miss the ball? Yeah, where was the 42 kids? Yeah. 42. Uh, 24, uh, chapter 2, verse 24. Or 24. Okay, that's what I missed. Because that's hilarious. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and... Evil, all at the same time. It seems like. Okay. So, so after Elijah takes care of the water, then he goes up to Bethel, and while he was on the way there, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him, saying, Go away, bald head. Translated, baldy, baldy. So they're teasing him about being bald. So what does he do? He turns around, sees the boys, cursed them in the name of the Lord. And then two she-bears, which are the most ferocious of all the critters, come out and they kill not just the two that were teasing him, but the other 42 as well. From there, he went on to Mount Carmel. <laughs> Another day. <laughs> so I was like, wait, what? You just teased him for being bald, okay? Many people of a certain age lose their hair. That's not a big deal. Um, but it made Elisha so mad that he had these 42 boys killed. So the commentary said, well, it's another sign that Elisha is not one to be trifled with. So the kings can't trifle with him. The little boys can't trifle with him. And it's putting Israel on notice saying that anyone who trifles with me is going to have consequences because I have the Spirit of God within me. This is a good lesson about bullying, right? Right? There you go. There you go. Okay, so real quickly, why does this matter is the, the question here. Um, it matters because the Jews, their whole faith is around the Exodus, Moses freeing the slaves, and then... The hope of Elijah getting taken up, and they hold on to that hope of Elijah, that Elijah is coming back. So you remember John the Baptist? Maybe he's Elijah returned. Nope. Then Jesus comes, and there's that transfiguration moment, and it's another validation that Jesus is who he says he is, and trying to show the Hebrew people, hey, this is the one you've been waiting for. Because even Elijah and Moses hang out with this dude. And so it just is testimony to the church's belief that Christ is the carrier of that same awesome life force, Ruach, of Elijah and Elisha. So that's why we care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I got two minutes late. Sorry, I bragged too soon. Thank you. Okay, and some people have asked, why are we jumping around between the New Testament and the Old Testament? These lessons are organized by first letter of the person we're studying his name, and we're going in alphabetical order to Zacchaeus at the end. So that's why, so next week we're in the New Testament. So that's why we're jumping around. That was, that David asked that this morning. That was a good question. Librarians love alphabetical order. There you go. That's it. Okay, uh, safe travels for Bert and Diana as they're coming back today. Patty Keith is having her second cataract surgery on Tuesday. Okay. Uh, pray for strength uh, for her family. This is Bridget. Don Floyd uh, has medical testing on the 21st of March. 
Uh, Laura's sister, Robin Dennis, uh, needs to make some cardiac appointments. She's putting this off and what about drive Laura crazy. Um, <laughs> praise that Edwin's vision is much improved. Diana, this is your brother-in-law. Yeah. And so, and so uh, second cataract surgery was on Thursday, the 22nd, but it's still cataract season, I guess. So uh, let's see. Okay, um, my niece, Leah Cochran, uh, her, her body's trying to reject her... her Cornea, is that right? Through. Yes, she had a transplant about two years ago, and I think I told you all she had has Fuchs yeah. disease, so she will eventually go blind if they didn't take care of this. So the ophthalmologist did a corneal transplant, and she had a staph infection in the eye. Oh. It took months to get rid of that. Oh, it wasn't at the incision; it was just in the eye, oh. other place, you know, another place. But anyway, and then she, and now. That she thinks she's trying to, the doctor thinks she's trying to reject it. And so. where does Leah Cochran live? Leanne. Is? She's in Marietta, Oklahoma. Yeah, North of Thackerville, yeah. where okay. the wind started. Any, any other prayer requests? Um, Merrick, the yep. facilities director, his son is uh, due, infant, due to have open heart surgery tomorrow. Oh, it was supposed to happen a couple of weeks ago, and um, the little guy, he's not an infant, he's yeah, a toddler right, running yeah. around, yeah. Um, but Hayes, um, he got a cold or something and so they couldn't do the surgery because he was sick. So they're really hoping that he doesn't get sniffles between now and tomorrow um, to have that surgery tomorrow. So okay. Merrick and Catherine, yes. and if you know um, the Kellers, Catherine yeah. Keller um, is their daughter, Merrick's uh, wife. And Kenton. Merrick, Kenton yeah. Mary's great kid. Uh, Gillette. Yeah. Okay, anything else? Let's pray. Thank you again. We appreciate you, Vanessa. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for a time that we can come and read scripture about the people in the past that we do get confused with each other and that we have the ability to see what strength and power they had um, to serve you. Thankful for the lesson from Vanessa and for this time and study she put into that. We pray for Bert and Diana for safe travels as they return from Colorado. For Patty Keith, as she has second cataract surgery on on the night on Tuesday, the nineteenth, we pray for strength for family for for Bridget, Don Floyd, as he has medical testing on March twenty first, be with him and those who are treating him. For Robin Dennis, Laura's sister, to um, take care of herself more and, and make appointments that are needed. We have a praise that Diana's brother-in-law Edwin' his vision is much improved after. His second, and we'll have a second cataract surgery on the 22nd. Um, Vicky's niece, Leanne Cochran, um, who has had such trouble with her eye for the from two years ago, is, is having um, a cornea is ha having her cornea transplant. This in uh, coming up, pray for her and those who are treating her that she can get relief from this for such a long time. We pray for for Merrick and for Catherine as their son is having open heart surgery tomorrow. Um, and we pray for those who are treating him as well, that this, this situation will be resolved. Father, we thank you for our church. Thank you for our pastor and staff. Help us to be your hands and feet in this part of the world. Now we pray. Amen. Well, you see that little sticker on the screen on Wednesday night. Right. Is that someone who's <laughs> anything wrong with his hair? I'm going to try and eat. What's his name? Hayes. Hayes. Well, Hayes. And then the older one. Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. The older one. Thank you. 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 Thank you.